you've not been here before? Excellent. Well, welcome. We're, we're so glad that you came today. And I would like to know who you are. Let me start over here. If you would just tell us your name and your faith community or the organization. Did you want your um, My name is Chris Lopez, and I'm from St. Mark's Episcopal Church. Welcome. You're our new partner in clothing. <laughs> Who else had a hand up? Uh, uh, sister Gwen Perry, I'm a BBM sister from Chicago, and uh, we're, we're shareholders of uh, Corsip. Excellent, thank you so much. We're welcome to Texas weather. <laughs> I'm uh, Sister Judy Byron, I'm from Seattle, and I'm part of the same group that uh, Gwen is with. Uh, we visited Dilly yesterday and we're shareholders, of course. Excellent. And you're voting shareholders, right? <laughs> Who else? Uh, Jim and John Martin, we're from uh, Northside Church of Christ. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. I'm Michael Langford from Hamilton, Texas, with a, an organization we call Family and Friends, and we are supporting asylum-seeking families as sponsors. Whoa! <laughs> you can sign up right here <laughs> if you're looking for someone. Where was another hand? I see the hand. It's kind of like getting to our church. I see it and not get there. Hi, I'm Mary Goodwin. I work with the Jesuits of the Central and Southern Province. We've been working with Core Civic NGO, trying to get them to adopt and implement human rights policies and then be transparent about reporting on that. So that we were here reading about that. And that's what was happening over here this morning, is that right? Oh, thank you. We're just really glad to be able to host you and to have you, all of you, as part of our group. Katie Merza with the American Immigration Council and the Delay Pro Bono Project. Excellent. Thank you for being here. Uh -oh. I'm Chase Cobb. Um, I just signed up and I'm ready to work. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we like to hear. <laughs> And a very warm welcome to all of you. This morning I've asked Reverend George Bradley to uh, say our opening prayer. Um, Reverend Bradley's church, one of Reverend ba Bradley's churches is El Divino Salvador. And they have given us two rooms now for several years in which to store and put together the backpacks that go to the bus. It's just a, an impossible dream almost to have that kind of generosity. Full disclosure, I'm not the pastor there anymore. Oh. <laughs> uh, but I still have friends there. Uh, let us pray. Merciful God, we are so grateful that you have called us all here together and, and we know it's summer and you're, through your providence you're taking care of people who need to have their rest. Um, but uh, nevertheless, you've set this passport pathway before us uh, by which we may live out your compassion and your care through our efforts and our thinking and our vision and our hearing. So strengthen us by your spirit that we might uh, walk uh, slowly and deliberately or quickly and maybe halt, maybe even, you know, with the, with the odd misstep, uh, that we may advocate for your children who are seeking succor in their lives. Um, we thank you for everyone who is here, and we pray that our eyes and ears will be open today. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, I believe, so. was Sister Sharon going to introduce our guest for today? Or? You are. All right, Rebecca. Wonderful. Come. Come on down. <coughs> Thank 
Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and let's give Viridiana and her baby a big welcome before I even introduce and give her your bio. Viridiana Carrizales, welcome. Come on up. But let me tell you a little bit about her. And I'm sure I, I won't do you justice because I know you've been working at this now for a long time. She uh, was, uh, lived in Dallas as a, as a young child, really, and went to, went to school up there, uh, did not have documents. And her experiences there as a student has led her in the direction that he has, she has taken throughout her short life, which has been many, many very positive things. So she, she, she really is focused on education and educating and creating safe places for students who are undocumented. And so she worked and co-founded the uh, Immigrant Schools uh, Program. She graduated out of UTSA, has her degree from there uh, as an undocumented uh, student. And then she worked for Teach for America where she placed undocumented students educators in schools across the country, in 11 states across the country. So she was able to, uh, to recruit them and place them in places of education. Uh, she recently had a baby, had a baby girl. Where is she? She's way in the back. And, and so she continues to work in, in education. She has uh, co-founded a school here for immigrants and she wants to create safe places for them. And in my, just as an ad lib, my uh, daughter teaches at Judson ISD. You, you may know that immigrants are overachievers. Students are overachievers. And so what Sara told me the other day was that the scores for immigrant students are what have picked up the scores for the overall school. That is, isn't that amazing? And so, absolutely, absolutely. And they, they were trying to move all the, this is for you to know, this is what's happening in, this, in the city. They were trying to move all the immigrant students, bilingual, which means immigrant, to another school. Take them all, there's 200 of them, put them in a smaller school. I don't know how they were planning on doing that. And, that, that, and then, so when that happened, then the, obviously the school, the scores for the rest of the school were gonna go down. And so we fought, and I was involved in that because I always like a good fight. Uh, to keep those kids in, in, those, in that school. Not, not because of the scores, but because it was gonna be difficult for them to go to the other school, transportation, their families, and all of that. It was uncalled for and irrational. By the way, I'm gonna at some point ask for your help in making sure that those kids are kept where they are. Candlewood is a really nice school. It's a beautiful school. And they were gonna be put in portables. Okay, just want you to know that. So here we go with uh, uh, Viridiana Carrizales, who is wonderful, who has been at it for a long time. And she, look at her, she's, I think, 20. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, give her a big welcome. Thank you so much, Rebecca, um, especially for that compliment that I look like 20. I'm already starting the morning on a, on a good note. But thank you so much for having me here to talk about an issue that is very dear to my, to my heart. For the next 20 minutes, I'm hoping to share a bit more about what M Schools is, the work that we're doing here in San Antonio to support our undocumented students and families who are in K through 12. I'll give you a quick update on DACA and in-state tuition for undocumented students. And then if I'm good, if I'm really good, I'll probably have a few minutes for some questions. So I'll make sure that um, you know, I kind of go through this so that I can have that space to answer some questions that you may have. But to tell you a little bit more about myself from what Rebecca shared, so I came from Mexico when I was 11 years old as an undocumented student. I grew up undocumented, went to K-12, through came to UTSA, and then I went to UT Austin, um, all being undocu an undocumented student. And this was back in the day when we weren't really having conversations about being undocumented. There weren't, very, there weren't many scholarships for undocumented students like myself. So I had a very difficult experience, especially in K through 12. None of my teachers made, uh, made me feel comfortable enough to share my status with them. None of them created a space where my experience as an undocumented student felt validated. And as a result, I never shared my status with any of them. And that it prevented me from getting information, from getting valuable resources that my family needed, from me learning about the opportunities that I had, especially in higher ed. 
When I did share my status with my high school counselor and, and as a senior in high school, he had never met anyone that didn't have a social security number and thought that maybe my parents just didn't know how to get me one. So he called immigration. When I was sitting in his office and the school, he called immigration because he felt he wanted to help me. He wanted to figure out how to get me a social security number. And he called immigration and he put me on the phone with an immigration official. Imagine that happening now. And this immigration official was asking me, but like, how do you mean you don't have a social? When did your parents come here? How did they come here? And they were asking me these questions and I just got this feeling of, of like, oh, that does, does, does not sound good. And so I told them that I didn't have that information and I was gonna call back, you know, because I had to ask my parents. And that was the last time I went to my counselor's office. So, unfortunately, instances like this doesn't just happen to, to me. There's more than 11 million undocumented immigrants in this country. 3.9 million of them are children who are in K-12, who are either undocumented or have at least one parent who's undocumented. Here in Texas, 13% of K-12 students are undocumented or have at least one parent who's undocumented. 13%, that's more than one out of 10 kids in our schools. Yet, um, despite this large number, less than 1% of school districts in the country have passed resolutions in support of undocumented students to protect undocumented students in our schools. We have 1,023 school districts here in Texas. How many do you think have, out, of, out of those 1,023 have passed a resolution here in Texas to protect undocumented students? Take a guess. Someone, give me a guess. Five. Five? Someone else? Eight. Eight out of 1,000, you were close. Here in San Antonio, only one. In San Antonio, San Antonio ISD is the only school district that has passed a resolution saying that they're protecting the rights of undocumented students. This is unacceptable. Unacceptable because in this country, there's a Supreme Court ruling that states that every child has the right to a K-12 education regardless of their status of their or their parents' immigration status. So it is the responsibility of the schools to make sure they're having laws that protect and policies that protect the rights of our students. Also, I'm sure that you just heard yesterday too what happened in Mississippi. There was one of the largest rates in this country in the past 10 years, over 600, I think in 80 people were detained. Um, I was looking at, at the news this morning and all the children that were left behind, family members, neighbors who were trying to like, give them food, trying to take care of all those kids that were left without their parents. And this is happening, and, and what's happening is that all these raids are impacting our kids, our kids who are in our schools. And if you have less than 1% of schools actually having plans in place to protect them, these kids are coming to school and afraid, afraid are coming to school really tr with a lot of trauma, and our schools are not prepared to support students the way that they need to. Um, in California two years ago, I'm sure you've probably seen this video or video about uh, this student called Fatima. She was 13 years old. She was on her way to school with her dad and her sisters when immigration detained her dad. And in front of her, they took his dad as she was going to school. So this is a quote from her. My dad was detained in front of me on my way to school. It was the hardest thing to watch but I still went to school because my father showed me the importance of an education. I knew I had, had someone to support me there. I want to make sure that our schools are like the school that Fatima is in. Because she still went to school knowing that school had her back and the school had people in place, bless you, people, had people in place to support her. I don't think that that's a reality here in Texas. It's certainly not a reality here in San Antonio and we need to change that. And that is why I founded in schools because I want to make sure that my experience in K-12 is not the same experience as students have here in Dallas, and here in San Antonio, in Dallas, anywhere in Texas. So one of the things that we do in, in schools, we do three things. One, we provide professional development for educators, for every teacher and school staff in our K-12 school. We provide professional development on things that they can do to make sure that they're supporting undocumented students, that they're having conversations about immigration through their curriculum, that they're assigning books, about immigration and how beautiful it is to be an immigrant in their schools. And that's one of the things that we do, provide professional development. We have partnerships with school districts here in San Antonio. SAISD is one of our partners. Southwest ISD is another one of our partners as well. The second thing that we do is that we're trying to work really closely by organizing our families, organizing allies to make sure that school districts 
More than one school district here in San Antonio can pass policy supporting undocumented students and families. I've had conversations with school districts here in San Antonio, and many of them said, this is not an issue. We don't have immigrant students here in San Antonio. They, I haven't had any parent come to me and tell me that they need help. So that is what's happening. So we need to make sure that they're, we're putting some pressure because schools are responsible to support our students. They don't have to wait for someone to come to them and tell them, please support me. It is their responsibility to do it. So that's the second thing that we're trying to do. And then the third thing, we actually do workshops specifically for immigrant students and families to share information about their rights, about access that they have to different resources in the city. We have a program called Charlas, which is kind of like an informal conversation. So we bring immigrants, mostly undocumented families, once a month. Um, and I, we gather together and they choose different topics that they want to talk about. So we've talked about purchasing at home, being undocumented. We've talked about opening a bank account. We've talked about accessing health services, fascinations for their kids. This is all the topics that they want to talk about. So we're creating a safe space for them to engage in those conversations. And we believe that by those three things, we can actually create the type of schools that our kids deserve. So that's what, what we do at M Schools. In our first year, we were able, here in San Antonio, impact 960 immigrant, mostly undocumented students and families by providing workshops on Know Your Rights, by going to schools and talking to them, and also through our Chat Lab program. We've also trained over 950 educators, teachers, who are teaching over 24,000 students throughout Texas. Um, and then we've also been working with 20 school districts and uh, organizations throughout Texas and also New York to make sure that they're incorporating some of these practices into their organizations or their school districts. So this is what, what we do at, at M Schools, and um, I'm here located in San Antonio, so this is one, our headquarters for M Schools, and I'm just really passionate to make sure that San Antonio can become the city where we can model for the rest of the country what it looks like when our schools are supporting our undocumented students. So we have a unique opportunity, and I'm excited about that, because there are school districts here in the city that gets it. There are school districts here that really want to make a difference for our immigrant students. So I feel like with all of us together, we can actually make that a, a reality. Here's a quote from one of our students um, in our chat lab. He said, M Schools workshops have helped me understand that it doesn't matter if you have DACA or legal status, that you can achieve your goals by arming yourself with the right support and information. We have a lot of um, undocumented students in our chat lab who are in high school who don't have DACA and who really want to go to college. And like me, many of them thought that they couldn't go to college because they were undocumented. Like me, many of them are telling me, I don't have DACA, I thought I couldn't go to college, so I, just, I was just going to you know, drop out or go back to, to my country of origin or just not, do, not, not pursue higher education. So we're um, doing a lot to make sure that our students are learning about their rights and education, that they're realizing that there's an opportunity for them to access higher ed without having DACA status. So really proud about that. But we need, we need your help. So here's some, some ways in which all of you here can, can help in this cause. The first thing is to make sure that all of our schools in San Antonio have policies and practices in place to support our undocumented students. I don't know where you all live, but one question that I want you to ask is whatever school district that you lived in, do they have policies to support undocumented students? How can we make sure that we're asking those questions to our school leaders and school administrators? Do they have policies to protect our undocumented students? Ask them if they have a protocol in place. What happens if an immigration official comes into a school? Is the school prepared on, on how to interact with the immigration agent? Do they even know the difference between an ICE warrant and a judicial warrant? I had a presentation to, uh, with 200 teachers um, on Tuesday, and I asked them to raise their hand if they knew the difference between a judicial warrant and an ICE warrant. None of them raised their hand. Because this is not something that we're trained in schools and educators, so how can we make sure that whoever's in the school is prepared um, and know what to do if immigration comes into the schools. Right now in San Antonio, we don't have schools that have these plans, and that needs to be in place. The second thing is to make sure that we're increasing access to resources. There are wonderful organizations in San Antonio that provide so many uh, important services and resources to our immigrant community. The problem is that our immigrant community don't are, don't, are afraid and don't feel that trust to come out and actually access those resources. So a lot of those resources, unfortunately, unfortunately go untapped. 
So what we have to do is like we have to bring those resources to our families. We cannot just host an event and wait for them to come to us because it's not going to happen. We have to bring these resources to them. And schools are a great way to leverage this. Schools are bringing families. Families coming to the schools all the time. Why aren't they, go, uh, come, when they come to school, why, why can they leave with information about their rights? Why can they leave with information about where to access health services? Why can they leave, use that space, that interaction that they have in our schools to leave and to access important information that is vital for our community? We have to leverage our schools. And our schools need to be responsible and they need to know that they have this opportunity to support our immigrant students and families. So again, ask whatever school district or schools are close by, what are the policies? Are they sharing information to students? Are they, are they utilizing or leveraging that interaction that they have with immigrant families or any parent to share resources that are vital for their success? And then lastly, create partnerships with schools. Like congregations, churches need to create partnerships with schools. There was a raid in 2006 in Ohio, and uh, it was like a very small town. I believe there was like 380 people detained, and it was a lot for this small town. So what happened is that all of the people, most of the people that were detained had children at the school. So the school, what they did was that they just held the children. So if the parents did not come to pick up the children, they took everyone to the local church. And then they took everyone to the local church and that's where parents were coming to pick up their children. They had a partnership with the local church to make sure that their kids, no one else were, were touching these kids but their parents or someone that, that knew them. That's the type of partnerships that we need to establish here in San Antonio. With congregations, with worships, with, with places of faith, with everyone. This is a work that we all have to do together. And that was a beautiful example that happened there in, in, in Ohio, that in the midst of that tra tragedy, um, that our community were coming together. We need to have something like that here in San Antonio. Okay, so DACA and DREAM Act. Thank you. Thank you, um, So really quickly on DACA and DREAM Act, and also talk about NC tuition. So right now, maybe probably you all saw it last month that the Supreme Court um, agreed to uh, hear the case on DACA. So they're going to make a decision. They're actually going to be hearing about DACA on November 12th. Um, given the makeup of the Supreme Court, it is likely that it's not going to that well, we don't know what will happen but it is likely that it may not be a good outcome so we are telling everyone who currently has DACA to renew it as soon as possible this is another way for us to also support our community is $495 to renew that's a lot of money for our folks a lot of money especially if we have families who have two or three kids that could potentially renew their DACA status this is a lot of money and um, I know it, with Tino and with different organizations, we were discussing about this um, late last year about ways that we can all fundraise money as a community here in San Antonio to help pay for some of these fees for, for students. Um, so that's that's currently what is happening with DACA. <coughs> Things are co continue to be in limbo. Our, um, many of, of the people, especially here in San Antonio, who have DACA just continue to kind of live their life in a two-year increment. Always kind of fearing whether or not they're going to have something permanent. So it's still a battle that needs to be fought, um, but that is the latest on things we should know more on, on November of, of this year. So if you know anyone who has DACA status, encourage them to apply, maybe figure out if we can host some like fundraising events for them, especially if you know people um, fundraise events to, to help them pay for that fee. And then for the Dream Act, uh, Dream and Promise Act, um, this is a piece of legislation that is actually really close to the DREAM Act that was introduced in 2007, which will provide a pathway for citizenship for many undocumented youth in this country, many of them who currently have DACA. So this is more of a permanent solution that we all need. Um, it passed, successfully passed the House uh, Judiciary Committee. It needs to go to the floor. Um, to pass the floor and then the Senate need to come up with a similar bill. Um, we're optimistic, but again, we know the makeup of the Senate and know, we know it's going to be a very challenging fight, so we don't know really if this is something that may happen um, soon. So right now, for our undocumented students and families, it's, it's a very, very difficult time, a very tough time, and it has been like that for, for many years. So I just want you to remember one thing about them, that they're so resilient. 
one of the most resilient people that you're ever gonna meet. Because imagine living in a country that constantly tells you you don't belong, constantly is trying to say you can't have access to this, you don't have access to this, okay, you can't do this, you can't do that. And yet they wake up every morning, they smile, they take their kids to school, and they're like our neighbors, and they smile, and they do all these things. There's so much strength and resilience in our kids, and I think we need to have those conversations and highlight that as much as possible. With in-state tuition, uh, that is still in place. Nothing has happened with in-state tuition in, in Texas. Um, right now, if you're in Texas, really since 2001, if you're in Texas, you have been here for three years um, and have graduated from a Texas high school, you can access in-state tuition and receive state financial aid even if you're undocumented. That's how I was able to go to UTSA and UT Austin. I was able to get my school paid for because of that law of that state law. That is in place and you do not need to have DACA in order for you to access in-state tuition. So if you know undocumented students who don't have DACA, who've lived here in this country for a while, who are graduating from a Texas high school, they can go to college. Okay? They don't need to have DACA. They can go to college. And you can connect them with us because that, that's sort of that, that's one of the, the services and the support that we provide for students. So in terms of what you can do on this side, and, and this is specifically with DACA, DREAM Act, and institution, is to promote or figure out a way that we can create as a community scholarships, a scholarship opportunity for undocumented students. We need to leverage the philanthropy sector here in San Antonio. There's so many people that give their money through the San Antonio Area Foundation. They have a, a lot of scholarships that they provide to students. Some of them required, most of them required, for people to be, for students to be U.S. citizens, why, why did, why is that a requirement? Let's talk to philanthropy to make sure they remove that requirement. This is our people in San Antonio who should have access to to those funds to be able to go to college. So let's figure out how we can motivate and encourage the philanthropy sector here to donate and make those funds available to our students who don't have status. And then with employment and internships, we need to figure out what are the businesses here in San Antonio that are immigrant friendly. Businesses that understand and they're creating like safe places for even those that have DACA status to work. Um, right now for many of our students who are undocumented, they don't have a way to intern or get paid for internships. So we need to work with our higher ed institutions, with employers, with businesses to make sure that they make it easy for students to intern with them without having to show that they have a social security number. Especially if it's unpaid, like not paid internships. They need to be able to do that. So we need to be asking those questions with employers, with businesses. What are they doing to create opportunities for immigrant youth to participate and to learn those skills? So those are other ways in which we can be, uh, be helpful on, on those two ends. And I don't know how much time I have, but this is a question, the question time. So I think I can take maybe one or two questions. Yes. Um, and I mentioned uh, one of our members, most of our membership is immigrant women. Mm -hmm. and, uh, a lot of them are undocumented. And they mentioned that on the South Side ISD, uh -huh. they could not take their children to the doctor if they did not have a Texas ID to take them out, to take them to a doctor's appointment. So they were requiring that. And that's like the, the school district? The school to take South Side ISD. So, so she was saying that uh, in the South Side, uh, the school district, maybe South Sun or South Side, South Side ISD, South Side ISD um, we're requiring parents to show a driver's license or a Texas ID in order for them to take their children out of school for a medical appointment or for any of those things. This is so, so um, unfortunately. This, this tends to happen a lot. I want you all to know something. The law in Texas does not require you to show our parent to show a driver's license or a Texas ID for them to come get their children at school. You can show a Mexican passport, a passport from Honduras, you can show a passport from whatever country you're from, or a matricula to get your kid from school. You're not required to have a driver's license or a Texas ID. So that's a violation of law. However, a lot of school districts, because every school district, if they're not, you know, they don't know this information, they all assume that we're all U.S. citizens in this country, that every parent has a driver's license. I've been to so many schools here in San Antonio, the first thing I get asked when I go to the front office is for my driver's license. So one of the things that I do in this trainings that I have for support for educators and for, for, for front office school staff is about that. 
about the things that we can do in our schools to make sure that we're creating safe spaces for immigrant families. And asking for an ID that they're not, they don't have is not a safe pra a practice to create that safe environment for them. So that is completely wrong. That is a violation. They do not need to have a Texas driver's license to get their kids from school. They can show any other type of ID that has been issued by the government, which means that they can use their passport from the or country of origin or any other ID that they have. But this is unfortunately what is happening. Yes, ma'am. So they're not reapplying for DACA. This is people who already were granted DACA prior to 2017. So they already have it. They already have a two-year work permit. So what we're, what we're asking them is to renew so they can get at least another two more years. In case something happens in November, they have that additional two more years. And that's what we're, we're uh, asking people to do. Mm -hmm. I will take one more question. And if not, uh, I wanted to end with this, with this quote. But does there... Any other question? Yes. I have some cards with me that I'll pass out. I don't think I put it in. Oh, maybe I did. Give me a sec. Oh, look, up there. That's my email, but I'll also give you my cell phone number and I have some cards um, as well. But I'll, I'll end it with a slide. But let me go back to this. Can we all just recite this together? It is our duty to fight for freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love each other and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Okay, here's my information. I'll have some cards um, as well, so I'm, I'm happy to pass this around. But thank you for having me this morning to share information about our schools. Yeah, I'll take one. Um, yes, right now we're in New York and in Texas. Um, my co-founder is in New York, so we're covering those two states for now, but in two years, we're hoping to expand to um, the next seven cities where most undocumented lives, which includes places in Nevada and California and Georgia and um, Illinois. So we do have some plans to expand to other states in the next two to three years. Thank you again. Thank you. I forgot to tell you, we're all moving to Kentucky to vote for Amy McGrath. <laughs> get you through the Senate. We'll try to get you through the Senate. Um, before I introduce Jean, our treasurer, I'd like to introduce someone that I never get to introduce because she jumps up too fast. <laughs> but it's her turn to kind of take over this meeting. Linda, Linda Baxter and I co-chair this committee, and we divide the work evenly. I do the fun part, and she does the hard part. She, the reason we have backpacks coming every day, every day, every day, is because Lena has raised funds, she's written grants, she's uh, conversed with uh, denominational organizations to collect the money we need. And just the other day, I heard her say something that is so significant. Um, she said, like, well, tell me, if we need more money, I need to raise it. It was not a question of, well, we might have to stop doing that particular thing. We'll just get more money. I'll just, which I know since I have the fund, uh, it means she will just find that money for us so that we can continue to do what we do. And so when she steps up after, well, I'll let you give her a round of applause right now. Also, a holder of much of the wisdom and uh, you know historical background of this organization. Um, Jean Heileman is usually racing all over South Texas in his truck, carrying blankets and carrying this and that for for Rio, Texas. But today he's here with our treasurer's report. Thank you. I was racing around getting a haircut, so I didn't get here in time <laughs> to hand these out. So here, as you can pass. There's not enough for everybody, so if you can share. <coughs> not, not everybody's excited about looking at financial statements anyhow. So. The difference between uh, Lena and uh, is that Lynn always reminds me that we're running late and so I have to hurry. <laughs> but but uh, I still will, will hurry. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, has happened is that this is a June 
report, and now we're into August. Well, that's going to change. We, we uh, purchased some, some uh, uh, software so that we'll be able to get more current data. The, the lack of timely data hasn't been too much of a problem because we have money. Uh, where, where that really becomes a problem is if you start running close. And we've been fortunate that we haven't been running close. Uh, but if you look at the statement, the obvious one that all of us see very quickly is backpacks. Uh, as of June, uh, for the month of June, we spent $32,649.72 on backpacks. For the year, it was $173,000 plus dollars on backpacks. That's our big expense and is running well over budget. That's what Lena is raising money for. I might add that that does not include all the donated things, the in-kind, so that the cost of backpacks is much higher than that. Um, for the month, we did raise $10,000 more than we spent. Uh, and for the year, uh, we've uh, raised uh, $17,527 more than we spent. So financially, we're doing okay, but that can change if the money quits coming in because it is still going up. There was one thing that I also wanted to announce. If any of you have Thrivent insurance or perhaps other insurances, you can check with your own insurance company. They are willing to donate $500 a year to uh, an organization of your choice. Um, with You just fill out a little form. Is that it? Thrive in Action Team. Excellent, excellent. So check, it, yes, it's easy for you to do and your bank account stays just the same as it always was. So, thanks. Any, did you have any questions for Jean? You're welcome to see me afterwards. I'm not trying to be cool or to cover my eyes because I'm crying. I really have difficulty with Mary Grace sometimes. She's very hard to work with. So, <laughs> so anyway, I'm doing, I brought my glasses today and I'm at an age now where I honestly can't see without them, so I'm having to wear my only other pair. Okay, for our minute, so we have 55 minutes, okay, and we're gonna get out of here on time. That's 11.30. So I need everybody who comes up to speak to rep, you know, not have it be more than five minutes, but really three. See what I mean? Yes. <laughs> well, because I have people, and Sister Sharon's not here today, but I have Sister JT, and they look at me, and I know that I need to keep things on time. <laughs> okay, so Sister Pat, do you have anything? And then also, would uh, Mary Grace, if you have anything, uh, Tara, or Lucretia, Terry? I'm just going down the board members. If you have anything, please come up so we can do this fast. I live with JT and she's sitting in front of me. <laughs> Our committee met and we have some new members and what we're doing right now is taking the chief issues that we want to concentrate, that we are concentrating on and become specialists, each of us specialists in the one that has our passion and then to be able to use some of the newer software we're working with to be able to send out to the membership when things are timely. Because a lot of us belong, all of us belong to a variety of different credible groups that have the same heart, the same passion, the same direction that we do. And we want the whole of membership to be able to send in responses and also to educate. So we'll also have in there not only, we'll be sending out not only you know, to take action, but also pieces of information that we find helpful. For example, the border, um, the whole border project has outlined in an incredible fashion the process uh, by which one, um, from asylum at the border to whatever happens thereafter, which is a complicated. Then another um, goal that we have is to deal with the varieties of uh, families we belong to, groups we belong to, have very different approaches to immigration. And Sister Sharon, who's also on this committee, not here today, uh, sent out um, a paper that we'll be sending, it's called Beyond Partisanship. And there's also a toolkit with it for, when you're getting together with your family, you can leave and decide to see each other again in the next five years. So, 
So it's educational as well as action oriented. So if any questions in that table in the back. And one of our newer members said this old paper, et cetera, is basically about trying to have short enough but interesting enough and honest enough that it can be an elevator speech that you can use anywhere and survive. Thank you. Okay. Mary Grace, do you have anything? Okay. Um, Terry, anything for collaboration? Could Joe, could you speak to this? Joe, can you speak about collaboration? No, yes. Not this. Oh, right here. Oh, yeah. It's Sunday, so we're going to send it out on this serve today, but just take this information down if you can attend. Okay, it's, it's a okay. It's a concert that's being uh, given at Madison Square Presbyterian Church, and it's to benefit the IWC. Plain and simple. So it's at two o'clock at Madison Square Presbyterian Church. Uh, Filigree is the name of the group, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, um, Sister Susan, okay, we'll give you five minutes because you have a lot more to do. I'll take everybody's time, so. <laughs> uh, Sister Susan Mika, I'm with the Benedictine Sisters, and I always say our monastery is down the street uh, down I-10 in Bernie. And um, just uh, our corporate responsibility project, uh, for those that are new, uh, we put together these uh, articles and some of the different court cases and some of the things that are going on in our area and we kind of compile those as part of our ministry to the um, coalition. And so uh, someone was teasing me before uh, we started all these meetings this morning that, you know, it's not fake news. No, we subscribe to these different publications so that we can uh, have the articles because many of you know, like, you can only get the first sentence or two if you're not a subscriber, uh, sometimes on the internet. So we feel like that is part of our ministry here. So this just keeps growing and growing. Uh, we try to put together some of the main articles that are happening. And um, so there's really not enough time to go through everything in five minutes, but you can look and see. We've tried to group them according to some of the things around the child detention, but also the um, one of the things that just popped out to me on the front page there is how many people have been apprehended by the Border Patrol in the first nine months of the uh, fiscal year of our government, uh, 688,000. So, um, but you can just page through and just see some of the topics and some of the uh, areas that we try to um, document uh, over the different, um, you know, the, just since our last meeting. So. And um, I think that, you know, like sort of in there too, we have uh, some of our local stories about our uh, city trying to get reimbursed uh, for some of these immigration funds that have been um, uh, spent. And I know Tino is here today too, representing our city. And, uh, you know, just so many of the things that are happening uh, collaboratively here, which is really awesome. And I know it, it, one of the articles, Henry Cuellar said that those funds were gonna be delayed. And um, so we'll see what happens there. But uh, there's many, many um, statistics just in that about how many um, people have been going through our city in the last few months. Uh, family separations. In that area, we have a celebrity with us today, Sister Jean Durrell, who was arrested. <laughs> Stand up. So uh, she was one of the uh, sisters, the nuns that went to Washington, D.C. and um, really laid down in the Capitol with the uh, children's pictures who have died uh, on their chests. And she was one of the ones that was arrested. So thank you for that witness. And I know that, you know, it got a lot of publication here in our city. And, you know, a lot of people, I think their awareness was raised. Uh, through your efforts, so thank you. Just to say, only a few people, only a 
Only a few people really got to lie down. I was not one of them. They had us already. And, and it wasn't planned. It was only five people and then another five. I'm not sure if the second five got to. You got to be infamous, so. <laughs> but anyway, and so just, you know, you can just see going through uh, how much is happening. Uh, two other things that I just want to raise up um, with uh, what's happening, too, is uh, some at the beginning of the meeting, some of our delegation that's here from um, our shareholder work through the Interface Center on Corporate Responsibility. Uh, th this um, work is we buy some shares in these companies so that we can raise the questions. And so yesterday, the uh, Jesuits are here. They lead the delegation with a core civic, but others have bought stock. And we went to Dilly to see the, um, the facility. Uh, we had all had to submit all of our paperwork a month ago, and I decided that you know we were too dangerous to talk to any of the um, people being detained. But uh, the, the core civic persons uh, gave us the tour and all. And uh, so anyway, um, so today we had a debriefing. Some of you saw the meeting that we had before this meeting to debrief and just to hear from others who are going into Dilly or who are lawyers and are raising some of those questions and see, you know, what we heard from the core civic persons and then, you know, what they see on the ground and that type of thing. And it informs how the shareholders try to interact with the groups. And I always remember Linda saying, I never knew that that was one reason to buy shares, but it's one way that many of the religious groups over, oh gosh, over 40 years have done this work, you know, to be able to raise those questions and put these things on the ballots of corporate America and interact with these companies and um, in all of that too. So, um, and it helps us, you know, on the ground. And, you know, we feel too that like we're resources to the other shareholders because we know so much of what is going on here and, uh, and you know, those kinds of things as well. So, um, and then the last couple of things on our, uh, on our handout are the um, whole things about the, um, you know, some of the events that are going on and then also we just keep trying to document the court cases as they come down because those are happening on a regular basis and of course our courts are still functioning, <laughs> you know, in that sense and making the determinations and, um, and that type of thing. And then just one other thing that I'll add, on that same um, July 18th when Sister Jean was arrested, it was a, like a sort of a Catholic nun uh, thing that to call the White House and to try to talk to the White House persons about, you know, how we felt. And so uh, it was very hard to get into the White House that day because so many people were calling and it was busy, 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 that type of thing. And several of the persons, I still want to write that up and we'll put it in our news articles before we put it onto the website, um, was that uh, some of the people from the White House, when people did finally get through, said, I think every nun in America has been calling us today. So, <laughs> so we're getting the message. And uh, so things like that, that was, that was the back and forth. And uh, so anyway, when you think that we're, you know, at a stalemate or that we're not making a difference, please know we are making a difference every single day. And I think when you see these articles, you see how much work there is for us to do. And thank goodness that every meeting we have new people coming in and saying they want, they're signing up for work. So thank you. Uh, is Moon here? No? Nope. Okay, she's probably out accompanying someone to an appointment. Uh, Sister Denise, um, Barbara, if you have anything on the airport, and Jane, are you here? Jane? No. Okay. Um, I didn't look up backpacks because I didn't know. Usually I do, and this week I did. Um, our numbers have uh, gone down quite a bit, um, those coming to the bus station. The numbers have really been uh, very low, but in the last week they went up from 900 and now 1,000 we heard. So, um, what was it 54? 54 people to the bus station this morning and 54 also to the airport this morning. So, those are higher numbers than we've had for a while. I think we had higher numbers yesterday, but not consistently. So um, we've gotten a lot of new volunteers. Um, 
uh, who are kind of bored at the bus station right now. But what we've been doing is trying to uh, get volunteers involved in the other areas with the, um, the clothing at St. Mark's, and then the, the showers have begun. So um, showers, I guess this is the second week. Um, showers is led by Sueño Sin Fronteras, and all the volunteers are um, cleared through IWC. And so uh, they have showers Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday afternoon. So if you're looking to volunteer, and they do need men also, because men take showers. <laughs> and then, um, and uh, you know, if it comes to a point where there's more volunteers, more days are possible. Wednesdays are not possible, because that's when um, the showers at Travis Park are, are used uh, for the homeless on Wednesday. Um, clothing. Um, uh, St. Mark's has agreed to take on the clothing. Um, to start with, they're going to do um, open a clothes room on Monday and Wednesdays. Salvation Army has get, uh, not Salvation Army. Goodwill um, has agreed at Commerce to uh, let the family shop there, but they have given us uh, can't remember the number here, Tina, 45, 50, 250. I don't know, a bunch of vouchers. <laughs> <laughs> worth $20 each and um, the expiration for those is the end of September. We were hoping that we could do St. Mark's Monday, Wednesday and then the other days have volunteers who could take the list and take the families on the list and go to Goodwill and um, that the Goodwill vouchers would stretch through October and November as St. Mark's um, gets going. But today we heard that they're not willing to go beyond the September expiration. So maybe we'll all just take a voucher, go shopping, and take the clothes to St. Mark's. I don't know. But um, so um, both um, things need, um, both of those outreaches need volunteers. Um, the volunteers um, at St. Mark's would be to obviously take care of the room there, and then also um, escorts to and from um, the resource center. shopping and shopping, going through and going through. And we're like, and they backed up showers for the afternoon. So there's people who ended up not getting showers because they were busy getting those clothes. So we thought, you know, this this is, you know, we want to make sure people get their showers. Yes? Where do the showers take place? They're at uh, Travis Park Church in their basement. Yeah. Any other questions? Just as a side, since Jane's not here to talk about the backpacks, as of, I think, maybe the 5th of August, we have uh, given out 21,762 backpacks, which is actually about 500 more than we gave the whole year last year, which was a tremendous record last year because the years before that had been 5,000. So we really have upped the number of backpacks for this trip today. Um, well, 21,762. That is the airport and bus station together. Okay, um, Joe, do you have anything about overnight hospitality? Um, well, the number uh, for overnight hospitality for the month of July, uh, overnight hospitality at the at the Travis Park uh, shelter 
I was over 5,000 for one month. And that brought us up to over 16,000 since, uh, since that shelter was opened at the end of, of March. Uh, but those are numbers, those are overwhelming numbers that are, you know, only, uh, you know, a huge, huge shout out needs to go to Carlos. the volunteers there and you know and it takes a lot of people to manage that and before I let John say his piece I want to give a, a wonderful grateful shout out to uh, to Jim Langford Come, uh, stand up Jim uh, the community Jim Langford stand up or wave at least you yeah yeah <laughs> Michael. I'm sorry, Michael. Michael Lincoln. Okay, I'm so sorry. Uh, and the community of Hamilton, Texas, a little town up way north. 167 miles north from this spot right here. Yeah, he drove here this morning to be part of this. Uh, they, uh, Jim and uh, Jim helped to organize the sponsoring of a family. We had a father and a son with no sponsor, no place to go. The child had been hospitalized, and uh, and he and his community had been preparing for this for some time, and uh, this was their time. And uh, if you want to talk about the joy, if you want to hear about the joy uh, that's contagious in the community. Grab Michael, <laughs> not Jim, forget about Jim. <laughs> Grab Michael uh, after this meeting. Uh, Especially if you're an attorney. What? Especially if you're an attorney. It's, oh, yeah, he needs to talk to an attorney. Yeah, okay. I just want to add three commercials really quickly. Um, so we know that, that Carlos's job is really, really hard. Um, uh, day in and day out at the shelter, and Emily and Cynthia, it's a really, really difficult job. And we need to support them as much as possible, buy them coffee, give them hugs. But the folks who are doing the volunteer work in the shelter at, at night, it is a really fun job. It can be a really wonderful time, um, especially if your volunteer coordinator opens with, our job here is to be a non-anxious presence. We're not supposed to get everything pre perfect, we're not supposed to make everything you know, run super smooth. We're just here to be a non-anxious presence and keep people safe. And then you can have a really wonderful bonding time. It's very meaningful for church groups. It's very meaningful for friend groups. The conversations you have at 4 a.m. are amazing. Some of the things that you hear yourself saying, wow, I really do feel that way. But I, I just want to encourage you um, uh, to, if you haven't done that work, reach out to some friends. Reach out to some friends who might not understand exactly what's going on because there's some, there's some really meaningful uh, interactions that can happen. Uh, but then we also always need to keep in mind how extremely difficult the job is for Carlos and for Cynthia and for Emily and give them as much support um, as we can as possible. The other commercial I want to make is the San Antonio Mennonite Church run the pastor. We have our hospitality house. Back in the day, we were just using numbers and numbers and numbers we're going through. Now, we just have families who have been there for a long time. The numbers are going through Travis Park Church, and we have families uh, who have lots of uh, either uh, family separation because of medical issues or because of the uh, detention centers. If you're interested in supporting one particular family, and I mean we're taking a mama to the doctor's office, because we have kids who've been with us for so long, we're enrolling them in school, and pediatrician appointments, and um, mental health uh, support. If you're interested in that, please reach out to me at the San Antonio Mennonite Church. It's a, it can be a very transformative thing, kind of a one-on-one -on -one deep um, relationship with one particular family. And then the last commercial is that um, uh, we lean very heavily on Sarah Ramey and the Migrant Center for Human Rights. Our church gives her free rent, um, but then that allows us to ask her for a lot of things, which is not fair at all. Um, but she is, is, is in need right now for fundraising. She spends all of her time in the detention centers working and she never fundraises. Um, so there are a number of people who are on her board here, but I just want you a reminder, reach out to the Migrant Center for uh, Human Rights, send them uh, some, 
some age, she's doing really, really fabulous work. And I just had that horrible realization, you know when you stand up in front of a group of people and you see someone that you owe money to? And it's nothing like, and she's also wearing sunglasses, which makes it so much more intimidating, so I'm going to pass the mic off real quick. <laughs> Those of you who are new, this is your first time you're getting a very different view than me. <laughs> Okay, now then, uh, are, those, are there those in our group who are, we consider our partners, our collaborators, our friends? Would you like to come up and talk about anything that's going on? I see Nate. Uh, do you know, do y'all have anything or you just want to keep quiet to me? Do you have something? Okay. Anybody else? I'm sorry, I can't even see very well with these sunglasses. So. Yeah. Good morning, um, I'm Tino Gallegos, I'm the Immigration Liaison for the City. Uh, so I have a couple of things. Um, first of all, we had a City Council peace session meeting where the Migrant Resource Center was the only topic of conversation on the agenda. That was yesterday afternoon. We had a very long, detailed report to our City Council and Mayor on the operations, um, how much money has been spent, uh, the different things, how it's kind of you know, come together and how it works and functions. and get some feedback and input from our council members on the right resource center and next steps uh, in the future. So I think it was a really, it was a really great presentation uh, for anybody who was able to attend. Um, and, you know, we have, we're in the middle of budget season. So uh, I think part of the reason you had to have the big presentation about the, the Migrant Resource Center was for the city to be able to, be able to justify making another ask to have these, these kinds of programs funded for the next fiscal year. Um, and included in, in, in that uh, discussion and presentation, obviously, is the great work that the IWC has been doing before we even started and has been a great uh, partner and collaborator and uh, teacher and uh, motivator and uh, coach and a mother and a father uh, for everything that the My Resource Center needs and does. Um, we've always been uh, very reliable um, allies for us in this work, and uh, we want to thank you for everything that you've done. Um, whether that's you know prodding us on on the days before and leading up to the opening of the center itself, um, to you know just be making yourselves available for all the help, right? You know, I see many of the people that work at the bus station and the airport all the time, um, and so. Um, I, I get to say it, and I get to live it, but I think it was really important for our leadership to hear it, uh, and I'm glad that they were able to, to hear about all the work that you had done in the past that was a precursor to what we're doing now, and how you continue to help support us in everything that we're doing. Um, and as was mentioned, you know, we have some new partners taking on some new responsibilities for what is being done in the bus station, and that's particularly in the areas of showers and clothing donation, which is tough, it's tough. Right. Those, are, those are tough logistical challenges, and I'm very glad to see that there's been more groups to be getting involved and wanting to do the work. Um, and uh, we're glad to see that it is being done, um, because it's something that's very obviously needed, and our, our guests have asked for it, right? We have had some success doing it, and, some, and it's also caused some problems for the actual center itself, logistically, so it is really helpful to have other people uh, step in and provide the capacity to move people and, and do the shower part of it, which was definitely a challenge. And also the clothes, you know, not just because it's hard to store them in the small space we have and then like, make sure that there's enough sizes for everybody. But I mean, you know, having people do that is really, really helpful and important. So, um, uh, on my other things, I wanted to just provide one, one little tidbit of information. Um, we are closing in probably somewhere here either the weekend or next week on 20,000 beds, um, bed, 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 beds being used for sheltering at Travis Park. Um, I think at the last, the last count we had was like 19,600 and some. So we're coming up on like a big milestone for us, right? Gone 20,000 since May, since March 31st. So that is a really, really big and important, um, milestone to hit. Also kind of gives us an idea of like, how far we've come. Uh, I was touring this space the other day with, uh, with some leaders from the LDS community 
I hadn't gone over to the to the shelter in a while. I looked around, I'm like, wow, twenty thousand people have gone through these and sat on these or slept on these cots. It's like it just kind of blows your mind if you've ever been in the space and seen the cots. They're all kind of just stacked up there on the side. Wow, and twenty thousand times that these have been used in the last few months, and it really is kind of blows your mind. Um, and, and on that note, you know, we have uh, a new uh, collaboration with the LDS Church. They've they've approved uh, about. 75 of their um, their people doing um, the, like, you know, the missionary yes, the missionary work here in the U.S. to work uh, on the migrant center and IWC and everything associated with it. So we're going to have some increased capacity for these. I think they're mostly young men, but there are also some young women who will be doing some work with us. And so, if there's anything that you can think for them to do, the right? So the overnight was going to be tough for them because most of their volunteer capacity is during the day, unfortunately. We did talk to them about that, um, but that, that's, but is there anything else, you know, even if it's kind of, you know, back, the, the back office kind of work, I think it's something else that maybe we could explore to have them help us with. Um, I have a couple other announcements unrelated to this. Uh, one of them is about the strategic planning process, and I know that we have some IWC representation at the first charrette that we did about a week and a half ago. Um, and that is the kickoff to this, this strategic planning process. Where we're going from here is um, we're going to have the input that people made at that meeting be the conversation starters and, and the drivers for work groups that are forming around certain just areas, whether that's education. Uh, you heard Edidiana talk about that earlier, or city services, or healthcare. Uh, any kind of concrete recommendations that people would have about to make San Antonio a more welcoming place for immigrants on those on those particular topic areas, we'd like to start doing some work groups on that. The other thing I'm looking for help with in this is that we we did we had our first listening session a couple of days ago with with refugee residents of San Antonio to ask them basically the same questions, but giving it giving them their own space to do it, not having these kind of big halls with you know all these other these other uh, people who work in the space, but actually hear from our residents themselves. So I'm looking for more organizations or people who would want to host these kind of listening sessions where you can bring some of our immigrant residents into a space where we have a facilitator, interpreters, take down what they say, and, and just let them tell us what they want to see from this community. So if there's anybody who, who would like to help with that, I'm looking at you at a summer, where'd you go? <laughs> but anyway, um, finally I have um, uh, an announcement from Anne. Uh, Anne says she's sorry she couldn't make it today. But Anne is asking for a couple of things. First, for people to come out to the global, it's up here, there we go. The Global Gathering for Compassion, which is going to take place on August the 12th at noon uh, at Main Plaza. It's going to be led by the Mayor and City Council. And Anne is looking for someone to represent IWC as a reader um, on the issue of migrants and asylum seekers in the litany of lament, lament and love. So if there's anybody who would be interested in fulfilling that role for Anne, um, I'm sure if you, if you don't have her contact information, I'll get it for you. But if you already do, feel free to contact her directly. She is looking for somebody and, to help with that. Uh, and she also sends her thanks for all of the co-laboring and co-loving for our migrant class. Anybody else have any questions for me? I'm sure they could be. Yes, um, yeah. yes that goes. You need to get them to join your for the Talk to me. Okay, I'll talk. Mm -hmm. I'll find someone who's on the way to do Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Great. I'll let Angela. Thank you. Um, Nate, you were here. Oh, right. okay. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Nate Roeder and uh, I run our bond fund at Raises. Um, and we have this rolling call for volunteers uh, to help us pay bonds. That's really just spending a day at the ICE office uh, at Crosspoint, handing in paperwork that gets people out of jail that day. So it's really important and it's really just a bureaucratic step. Um, if you're able to do that, um, 
get in touch with us at volunteer at iusistexas.org. Um, and we have these other rolling uh, volunteer needs as well, and we massively appreciate it. Um, the other thing that's not up here that's been really causing me to stay up at night is the expansion of the migrant protection protocols, the Remain in Mexico policy that last month extended to uh, the Laredo and uh, Rio Grande Valley ports of entry. And that's been a really difficult uh, problem to attack, and some of us in this room are kind of working on that right now, and it's kind of a constant discussion among uh, folks in Texas to see what we can do about that. There's been some amazing work uh, in Tijuana and San Diego that um, I was able to check out last month, um, but it'll be hard to replicate in Nuevo Laredo. Um, so keep that on your radar as we're thinking about kind of the policy changes, think about why there's fewer people at the bus station because people aren't getting let into the country and they're being forced to remain in Mexico, um, in Texas. So that's just kind of a uh, generalized source of trauma for a lot of people. Um, and Mariela runs our bus station program, and I will hand it to her. Yeah, so things have definitely been a lot slower at the bus station, less people coming in. Um, but we're still showing up and doing what we can. This week, um, we actually transported 40 individuals to their first ICE check-in. Um, so a lot of the people that are crossing in um, Eagle Pass and um, Del Rio are being assigned ICE check-ins on the first Tuesday of the month. And so for the people that have been at the Migrant Research Center for a couple of days or weeks that had to show up at the ICE office but couldn't make it to their final destination sometime, we were able to transport them in collaboration with the city of San Antonio to that first ICE check-in and provide accompaniment. So we're glad that we were able to do that because for the people that don't don't have travel arrangements or don't have sponsors, being able to check this one thing off that list was just brought so much peace to them. Um, so we're able, we're glad that we were able to do that. Yeah, question? Yeah. Um, Sunday at the bus station, there was an individual who had um, was scheduled to have her um, hearing at, on a Tuesday at one o'clock in Miami. But she wasn't going to get to Miami until 10 o'clock in the morning. And so the fear, but there was a, the bus leave in San Antonio was late, which meant all of the other buses might also be late. And we didn't know what to tell her about um, what happens if she missed that. Because we told her, as soon as you arrive in Miami, tell your family, take you immediately there. You know, because you have to be there. Because we didn't know what would happen if she missed it. So what would have happened if she missed it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, so the question is, what, what happens if someone doesn't make it to their ICE check-in on time? In our experience, uh, we've made the same recommendation for them to show up as soon as they can when they arrive to that final destination. And we've never come, we've been able to follow up with people to make sure that that worked. And we've never come across a situation where um, there were negative consequences for, for not making it on time. Um, yeah, that's, that's what we've noticed. I don't know if you... I mean, they could, but I don't think that it's absolutely necessary. Yeah, and so that's like what's happened in the past. And so we can't provide any sort of advice like you show your bus ticket and you'll be fine. We can't say that. But we, what we can say is that in the past when this has happened, it hasn't been a problem. I would probably recommend that somebody take their bus ticket to say like, hey, there was no way I could have physically made this. But we can't say what ICE is going to do at a given uh, field office. And so we can't provide that sort of advice. We can just say what has happened in the past and hope that that, that bears out in the future. Yeah. What's working in Tijuana that you saw? What's working in Tijuana that I saw? I wouldn't say that it's necessarily working, but it was an incredibly inspiring a uh, program that was put on by a number of groups, uh, including Al Otro Lado and Innovation Law Lab, and probably some others that I'm missing, but uh, it, they, Al Otro Lado is a legal service provider in Southern California and in Northern uh, Baja California, and they have um, a four-story 
building in Tijuana and on the ground floor is a cafe where they get uh, food donated and it's open to everybody and um, it's on a sliding scale. On the second floor is a medical clinic, on the third floor is like a, a kind of legal space and childcare, and on the fourth floor is the law offices. And so when I went, it was a, it was a pro se I-589 workshop, and so it was helping people who were enrolled in the Remain in Mexico policy fill out their asylum applications so that they stay in good standing with the court that they're, that they're uh, being forced to go to that's in San Diego, but they're not allowed to leave Mexico. And so it was a workshop with volunteer lawyers who were coming down for the weekend, who were filling out people's asylum applications with them, and I was, was also helping people fill out their asylum uh, applications. And it was also uploading everybody's documents um, to a, a super secure server so that when they went through, if when they eventually made it, if ICE or CBP had, had taken their documents, they had access to them because they were, they were storing all of that. Um, it was also like a huge source of solidarity. I've never been to any of these like legal workshops where there was so much breaking down of kind of the like attorney client uh, hierarchy relationship there. there, there were, it really felt like we were all in this together, um, kind of elbow to elbow with people who had been uh, subject to this horrible inhumane policy. And so the strategy is keeping people in good standing with the court while they're forced to remain in Mexico, providing all the information about what this incredibly complicated policy really is and what the expectations are. Um, and then getting them in the best possible situation to win their case uh, when it actually does go to that uh, individual hearing that, that can be so perilous. So I thought it was working. It's, it's hard to replicate in Nuevo Laredo because Tijuana and San Diego, it's just different in terms of what organizations are existing and what the infrastructure looks like than in Laredo and Nuevo Laredo right now, but that's something that uh, that, that a lot of really smart, really hardworking people are, are working on um, right now. Question? Yeah, so what, what does that look like right now in Nuevo Laredo? What does it look like right now? Um, so I'm actually not doing a ton of work myself on it. I've been kind of party to a few of the calls and conversations. Uh, I don't know if there's anyone from Justice for Our Neighbors here. Yeah. <laughs> so Jayvon, I've been in touch a little bit with um, with Jay Fon. I'm just like exploring doing some work in, in uh, Los Dos Reyes. I don't know if you want to talk about it or if I shouldn't talk about it. But, um, but I've been incredibly uh, admirable of their kind of like, like kind of taking the lead to jump in. Um, but I don't think anything has started yet. Um, I hope it does. There's also folks at UT Law who are kind of coordinating a lot of the kind of the local efforts with people who are doing it nationally to set up what will probably amount to um, the same kind of like service, like doing that asylum workshops, uh, filling out the applications, but probably not the same model. It might be something that's more remote. Um, or even if it's just like information gathering and, and providing like know your rights, Charla, so just instructions, there's that too. Also, a lot of the people who are enrolled in Romania, Mexico, in Nuevo Laredo, are actually in Monterrey. They've been bused to uh, Monterrey, and so providing access there is also complicated. Yeah, well, no, it's just because this gets kind of interesting because if, if you have a whole response network here, but those numbers start to slow down, how do we begin to to understand the possibility of transference of energy or supporting those things yet to come yeah. on the Mexican side. Right, so to kind of the statement question was, we have a, re a response here, how do we translate that to the Mexican side? And that's the challenge. Yeah. For those of you who were here in 2014 when we began, mm -hmm. Just think about the meetings we had then yeah. and what we're doing now. How we have how we have transformed our ourselves. We're, our mission is the same. 
you know, I mean, we're walking alongside people and changing to the different needs that are happening, but we have stayed true to that. But just think about all the things that have changed. I stand in awe of the people that have spoken about what you're doing. Um, I really am humbled to be able to know you and be your friend. Um, and I am grateful to the people in the IWC who uh, continue the fight. And every day, they don't give up. So thank you very much for being here. Um, thank you for sharing. And let's all think about this over the next month to see what we want to do, how we want to move forward. Uh, thank you very much. Um, quick update on a couple of uh, case law updates. Um, first, as a matter of LEA, as a quick update, this is a case where um, a man in Mexico was threatened um, by a cartel. Um, the cartel wanted to sell drugs through his father's store. They threatened his father, then they threatened him. He fled to Mexico, or he fled from Mexico to the United States, um, and they attempted to kidnap him and shoot him. Um, quick background on asylum cases. Asylum is based on um, persecution based on your race, religion, nationality, or membership of a particular social group. That can be such as if you're gay, if you're from a certain tribe, on your politics, or as it has been established in a lot of case law, based on kinship, your family. Um, unfortunately, acting uh, Attorney General Matthew Whitaker um, in December of 2018 handed out a decision that kind of chipped away at a particular social group being based on kinship and unfortunately denied asylum in this case. A lot of attorneys are worried right now because unfortunately a lot of cases in process, I'm currently working too right now, where essentially threats are being made against your family or your basis for asylum is based on your family. Um, unfortunately that's going to work to hurt cases. Um, so that's one thing that's kind of in the pipeline and you'll be hearing a little bit about. The second was a migrant protection protocol. A little, few people alluded to it. As a quick update on that, um, usually when you uh, come to the United States and try to establish a case on, um, on for asylum, you usually go through a credible fear interview, and that allows you to stay in the U.S. detention center while you do that. Um, as other people have alluded to, this Remain in Mexico program means that they're being sent back to Mexico, usually given court dates three or four months out, and unfortunately that means attorneys cannot help you. Um, as Raiz has mentioned, um, U.S. attorneys can't really work with you when you're in Mexico, so you've got to, you know, unfortunately rely on volunteers or the very few past attorneys who are willing to travel. Um, it's very difficult when we go to Pearsall and we need that face-to-face -face time with people. So you can imagine how much more difficult, as the gentleman in red alluded to, how much more difficult it is to actually establish your legal rights and protect your legal rights when you know, you're homeless, essentially homeless, and hundreds or even thousands of miles away. Um, so those are our updates. We're the Migrant Center for Human Rights. Um, I've got a newsletter signed up here. Uh, if anyone, I'll go ahead and put it in the back. It's a yellow sheet. But anyways, thank you for your time. Um, yeah, God bless.